Oh, yes. Hello, everybody. Yep. Hello. This is David D. Hilster, and this is a really great moment. Uh, we have uh, with us today James Grist, who's uh, been interested in, in starting a sort of a discuss discussion group. And I said, hey, James, we've got this great fuse that we pay five or six hundred bucks a year for our membership. Uh, it's well worth it because it's a really great system. They really allows people from all around the world to use it. When you have a professional system like this, of course, you've got servers that can hold up to the to to it, whereas a lot of times the free stuff. But of course, I know Bill Bill um, talked with Bill Lucas about that because I know he has some some uh, really good software as well. But we're using this for 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 now. And um, for those of you who don't know, expansion tectonics, of course, is the idea that the Earth and other bodies in the universe have been expanding. In fact, we don't have a fixed radius. There's a lot of great arguments for that, but I'm not here to argue that or not. I am a great fan. I came across that back in 2008, about 10 years ago. And since then, I've been spending a lot of my own time with the uh, CMPS trying to get that word out. I know there were people before me, and they would occasionally give talks, but I was really at that point, I became a real, how do you say, pounding in people's head, giving talks about it, and making sure everybody knew about it, and um, uh, always a, a looking on, uh, we have online in our database, if you go to db.naturalphilosophy.org, uh, uh, um, and you click on the topics, you will see the top expansion tectonics, and I believe we have the largest database of expansion tectonicists in the world, almost 90 people, I think. And we have um, and hundreds of papers and books uh, also cataloged, so if you're interested. And James, of course, uh, I met on Facebook, I believe is how I met him, and I saw some of his great animations. My gosh, it blew me away. Uh, last time I was blown away was by, um, like that was with um, Neil Adams. He was the one who I first saw the videos where he does that, those great animations. And that's where I first learned about uh, expansion tectonics. And then when I saw um, these crazy videos where this guy put all these balls together in space and started just growing them, and you could actually see if it wasn't even calculated. It's just a, a simulation of expansion. I was also blown away, and I got to know him uh, via the Internet and uh, via Facebook. And so he communicated just recently, like I said, that he wants to – uh, maybe have a group meeting and I said hey use our software that's what it's all for so we're here we are um, I really want to thank James for doing this uh, I think he's he's got a lot of modern ideas about what's going on and I my my goal is not to be heavy-handed in this at all and hopefully that we'll have uh, James and the group itself organize itself uh, get itself going, make this rules for what you want to do. This is all open, I think. Um, uh, having a person sort of in charge is always good, but we need to know how frequently this is. So, James, one of the things we want to find out today is like a test run. You know, what is this? How do we want to do it? And I know my dad did gravity meetings. They decided, I think they did it every two or three months, but this can be weekly. It can be biweekly. It can be monthly. That's up to the group. It is a service that's provided to all the CMPS members. And if you are a member and you want to do something like this, I think we could actually do them on Saturdays, you know, and have them piggyback one after another. Uh, it is open. Just give me an email shout, and we can uh, meet via Fuse itself, and we can, you know, have you start a group as well. But I know there's a lot of interest in expansion tectonics. And I'm really appreciative of everybody being here and supporting. And I'm going to pass this over to James. Uh, he will be James Grist, who uh, is uh, can tell you a little about him, a bit about himself. But he does have his um, bio on the our website. So if you want to read about him, check him out on Facebook and all that. And hopefully he'll tell you about that. And I greatly appreciate that, James. And I'm going to pass it over to you and get the heck out of the way. Well, thank you, David. Uh, hello to everybody. Uh, yes, I'm James Grist, I'm a science graduate. Um, my degree was in science computers, maths and engineering. Um, I've had a lifelong interest in science, uh, physics in particular. Um, but yeah, that changed in 2012 uh, when I saw Neil Adams's video on the internet about um, 
the growing earth and uh, I really had to stop in my tracks and just really watch that video because uh, it, it blew my mind it's um it's uh, I just watched it about five times and thought well how could I have uh, uh, you know it was you know, different to anything I'd ever seen and um, and uh, I but immediately when I first saw it I thought hey that works and um, you know I'd, I'd done geology at school and uh, the theory never quite came together for me there so um, uh, I suppose in my mind I was open to new ideas and and that straight away I saw that this one was good so uh, yeah I sort of stopped my um, interest in physics and started getting into the uh, theory of the growing earth this alternate um, geology theory and um, that's what I've been doing for the last uh, seven years now I think um, yeah, um, David was saying um, I wanted to have a go at this conference and uh, one of the reasons for that is I think um, when you look at the number of hits on YouTube for Neil Adams' videos, uh, they, they, you know, there's over 2 million hits now. So it's a, there's, a, there's a lot of people potentially. I know, I know each one of those hits doesn't co correspond to a, an individual. Perhaps the same person had watched it five or six times, but still you're looking at several hundred thousand at least. And uh, I mean, I always like to compare um, our group with uh, the Electric Universe group, which is uh, a very professional, I think, um, group that has um, built itself from nothing, really. They don't have any funds from any universities that I know of, but it looks to me like a an amateur casual group that has become so popular that it's um you know now self-sustaining and it's it's getting a lot of traction uh within professional circles even even though they initially were very um outside of uh, professional um astronomy and things like that but now they um when you know the the, the upload pay, um, videos um often on their channel and uh, it's impressive that they can show that um, there are a lot of professional papers coming out um, that that use electric universe ideas and you go back 10 years ago and there weren't really any papers um, as far as I'm aware but now you know they've really made um, a big difference um, and I just think you know we should be doing that with the growing earth theory as well because uh, it's if anything YouTube's anything to go by, then it's even more popular. But we just don't have the um, uh, we just don't haven't got the group going. So this is it. Hopefully, this is the start of um, uh, a bit more interactive and video um, growing Earth theory. So, um, what do you think to that then? Does any, does everybody agree with this, or uh, am I going off on a wild one here? Um, this is David. Um... I think that uh, it's interesting. I have been following the uh, Electric Universe as well, and they went over 100,000 subscribers. I just didn't pay much attention mm -hmm. to it. And YouTube is an incredible venue. One of the mm -hmm. things I do want to say is that we are we already have four YouTubers. Um, I think we need to get more people out there. And James, the people in the ET area, I think we need to get them out there and uh, you know perform. Uh, a regular YouTube channel videos because that's how you grow it. Um, I started in May of last year, so it's not even been a year. I have had I'm approaching thirty thousand views on my channel. So I right. I I, I've, I went from zero to almost three hundred and fifty subscribers. Mm -hmm. I have subscribers all around the world. In fact, from sixty countries. And this mm. is the way to do it. And um, so, yeah, the, the Electric Universe, the, the only thing they have on us is they started in 2008. So they're 10 years ahead of us. So yes. we can do the same thing. And I think the other thing is, is we have a lot of different areas. And if we band together and do that, so I would invite anybody who would in, be interested to start a channel. And, and James, I think this group, we need to get somebody out there talking uh, about it. So... Yeah, mm -hmm. I think we and 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 I actually have another great idea that they don't even have yet that I'm going to launch very soon. So yeah, we need to get organized. I agree, I agree with you 100, percent and we're we're getting there. Well, good. Yes, um, you know, I just think um, even if it starts out very casually and just people chatting their ideas, 
then um, then that's a good start, and it should build up from there. You know, we don't have to we don't have to start with anything big; just start small and build up from there. Um, uh, anyway, I was going to talk a bit about geology and um, and uh, some of my ideas now. Um, I should point out that um, one of my big influences uh, was Thomas Gold and his book, The Deep Hot Biosphere, which um, which really impressed me. It was um, it, again, it was a very different model to um, what had been taught in school about geology. Um, he, um, I mean, uh, for a long time, I was um, on the forums before Facebook and um, Twitter sort of became popular. I mean, uh, for me, that was before then. It was a lot of fun. I used to argue so much on the forums, and uh, I went to lots of forums where, you know, they, they were discussing ideas that I'd never thought of or never heard about. And one of them was uh, P. Coil for a bit. This is just a story um, about the past. Um, but um, one idea that popped up was that was interesting was oil was abiotic. And uh, to the peak oil community, they just found that idea abhorrent because uh, they kind of enjoyed the sort of um, the coming crisis. Um, it was um, the end of the, the world is going to end tomorrow kind of thing uh, because oil was running out because it was a fossil fuel. There's only so much in the ground and uh, we'd been we've been using oil so um, prodigiously. Um, for the last hundred years or so, it's going to run out. But occasionally, you get this uh, person coming up saying, "Oil is abiotic; it's not going to run out because it's been produced in the mantle." And uh, we could never quite refute them. In, I mean, I was a peak oil at the time, but um, and I just thought, well, I just can't quite see how to destroy this argument. But um, it, it's uh, it doesn't fit in with our ideas. Anyway, um, peak oil didn't really happened when we thought it was going to happen. We were all sort of um, hedging bets around 2005 to 2008 to 2010. It never really happened. And uh, so we were proved wrong. And I had to just say, yep, I was wrong. I've, got, I've learned something. And I thought, well, why isn't the oil running out? And I had to, I had to, I was forced to consider it might have been abiotic. So I ended up reading this book by Thomas Gold, and he just lie, uh, laid it out very clearly that there was a very strong argument for oil being a abiotic. And um, because the internet's so vast and uh, there's so many people talking, it was quite easy to find other people that were uh, very um, in tune with this idea. And uh, you know, there's web pages where they've written huge amounts on this. And I, I just went there and read it all, and uh, it just made a lot more sense you know but uh peak oil was the first sort of it it was the first community where i sort of stepped in trying to find my way trying to find ideas because um you, you know when you leave school and uh you leave university you've got all these ideas in your head and you feel uh quite strongly that you you uh, you understand things now but when you go out there and you try and um apply these ideas in the real world um it's they don't always work so and um you know you, you get hit by a lot of arguments that you've never heard of before and this was one of them so i mean um yeah that have sort of happened before i got into growing earth um so but it, it got me thinking and um i suppose that's one of the reasons why i was a bit more in um what's the word a bit more um open to the idea of a growing earth but it was all little ideas in the back of my head. I could not quite pinpoint why exactly I love the growing earth theory as soon as I saw it, but it, um, I suppose I experienced in my life that um, geology just didn't quite add up for me. So anyway, yes, that's enough uh, introduction. Um, by the way, has anybody else read uh, Thomas Gold's book? Um, um, what's it called? The Deep Hot Biosphere. Just in case, uh, let's see now. Um, I haven't, uh, I didn't even know about it. I, I believe in abiotic oil. Actually, uh, a really great story is one of the guys who just passed away a few years ago. He mm -hmm. um, he was a, uh, a, a growing earth guy, and he had taken some oil, and mm -hmm. he put it together, and he put it outside, like in the ground, 
and it, was, it got a lot of pressure and stuff. And he and I was sitting with him one day, and he at, at lunch at one of our conferences, and he puts it on the, as um, Scarborough. That was his name, and he's he's one he was one of the recipients for his work in, in expansion technology. He put that on right on the table in front of him. He goes, "What's that?" He goes, "Boy, it looks like coal." He goes, "No, it's not coal. It used to be oil." And it was really interesting because he he was talking about that same thing, abiotic oil, never even heard the term. And there he was taking, showing how coal was made from oil, and he he was just doing his own experiment with that. Uh, I can you get a, a get us a link to that? Um, we can put that uh, when when we uh, have the recording of this, we'll put that link down to it. I'd love to get the book. I've not read it myself. So uh, we'll get that afterwards. We can send it, or maybe uh, um, send it to people so we can can get that. Because uh, that'd yes. be great. Uh, what, shall we do it after after the? Um, yeah, yeah, that would be fine. Then. Okay, yeah. Then. All right. Well, um, now I'd like to try and talk about geology and uh, try and pull people in and get people interested. So let me just bring up my notes. Um, yeah, the, let's just take a starting point. Um, when we're thinking about the earth and um if we're all on board that we're, if we're going to assume that the world is growing and that it is round uh, i mean spherically round um then immediately there's a um an, a, ge uh, a geometric um a point a geometric point that um i don't mean uh, uh, no i mean um there's a mathematical result with uh, spheres that when they grow, you really can't um, grow them by installing uh, a 2D shape in them. Let me just let me just uh, take a step back from that. When you, um, if you have a sort of uh, box or um, a stack of paper, you can grow that stack of paper paper by just putting a slice, another, another sheet of paper in it. And, uh, and the point is, if you do that, you've still got um, a box or um i call it a box it's a 3d rectangle and you can keep doing that and it, it always stays as a as a rectangle a 3d rectangle a stack of sheets um you can do it with um a stack of you can do it with a cylinder you can put in a um if you have um, a stack of plates and you put in a plate in the middle you still have a stack of plates at the end but if you try and put a you know if, if you try and do the same thing with a sphere if you try and put a slice uh, you know um Oh yeah, a little sli a circular slice, and put it into the um, sphere. What you end up is you do not have a sphere at the end of it. You have you have um, a sphere with a tiny cylinder in the middle. And if you keep on putting slices in, you end up with a, a cylinder with two round ends. But it's a mathematical result that you cannot add. Um, you cannot grow a sphere by adding two D slices in it. Um, okay, so that's quite easy to grasp. Now the question is. Why am I making this point? And that's I'm making that point because um, current belief in geology is that um, there is new material coming to the surface at the um, oceanic rifts, the mid-oceanic rifts, <clears throat> um, and that that's probably true. I think that's correct. Um, but it's important to understand because of this mathematical result of this sphere. That it has to, um, it can't grow just by installing um, 2D slices in. That um, it doesn't matter if it's a, a nice um, two-dimensional uh, flat flat plane. It doesn't matter if it's a flat plane or a, or a, or a bendy plane. Or, I mean, a crooked plane. Um, but the point is, it doesn't matter how you have um, how wriggly your line is. That um, is the Mid oceanic rift. If you install a 2D shape, you're going to end up with something that is not a sphere. Um, so you've got to ask, well, how do you grow a sphere and keep it a sphere? And the only the only way to do it is to um, um, have the sphere growing at every point on the sphere. Um, so it's the obvious analogy is a balloon. Uh, the balloon expands when you blow it up; it expands all over its surface. Um, you could you couldn't um, oh, let's see. Um, I mean, uh, people might try and figure out that um, you can have um, you can have it the earth drifting here and then it drifting there. 
and that'll be all right. In fact, if you look at my um, program Tigress, uh, the latest version of it, the version 0.5, I have it rifting all over the place. It, it just, um, there's no, I mean, that's the main difference between the third, the fourth version uh, and the fifth is between the fifth and the fourth. It, um, it rifts in only specific places on the fourth. On the fifth, it's rifting all over the place. Um, but it's unrealistic because um, because of this um, point that I'm trying to make is that the the, um, the sphere has to grow right down at the small scale. It must be growing everywhere. Um, okay, so if if you accept that, then um, what it means is that when you look when you when you look outside, you should see be seeing uh, geography and geology that is a direct result of growth on the surface. Uh, simply because you, you can't say to yourself, oh, yes, the Earth is growing. Yes, it's uh, the result is happening on the surface, but it's happening, you know, deep in the ocean somewhere and I can't see it. And if I look outside, then, um, you know, what I see is more in tune with conventional geology. You can't say that because uh, the Earth really does have to be growing at a very localised um, point, a very localised area everywhere you look so what i'm going to try and say uh what i'm going to try and get across to you in this uh conference is is that if you look outside then the chances are the features that you're seeing are a direct result of growth under your feet and and it's not only that but it's happening right now um okay so um before i go on does anybody want to say anything about that what do you think to that idea eh? Now let's see now. Um, so, uh, I have been working in this area, and uh, I'm a theoretical physicist, and I've uh, improved the theory of electrodynamics. And from that improved version, I was able to derive the force of gravity. The force of gravity, from an electrodynamic point of view, is the force between vibrating neutral electric dipoles, like dipoles, quadrupoles, octopoles, multipoles, they're called. And uh, what I found is that the force of gravity is decaying. And when the force of gravity is decaying, the effect on the Earth is that it is expanding, not due to material coming in from space being added to the surface, but just the, the mass of the Earth is expanding. And uh, it's uh, amazing. I have just recently obtained uh, firsthand data on that expansion because if the Earth is expanding, its rate of rotation should slow down due to conservation of energy and momentum. And uh, I didn't know that we had data for that, but it turns out in the coral reefs found in various parts of the world, there are rings, just like tree rings but they have more information than a tree ring. They also have a ripple, and that ripple tells you how many days there were in a year. And so what you find is the oldest uh, uh, coral reefs that we have found, uh, there's 421 days in a year, but now there's 365. And so that seems to indicate that the mass of the Earth is staying approximately the same, but it is expanding and slowing down this rotation rate. The other thing is uh, uh, I work with the U.S. Navy, and they uh, have sonar on all of their ships, and they make a sonar log. And the sonar log shows you how deep the ocean is, and so they're making all these paths on all the different oceans of the world where they've had Navy ships go, and they've taken them over the years, and they've been able to produce a map of the bottom of the ocean that shows where the continents used to be joined together, and you can see the expansion over time. So now we have that, and that's what uh, uh, the uh, cartoonists uh, what was his name who did the expansion of the earth? Neil Adams. 
Neil Adams. That's what he used that data in order to know how the, to make the Earth go in that cartoon he produced in the video. And uh, so, uh, so anyway, we have that, and uh, that data is uh, very precise. And what it shows is that the continents are moving apart. Also, we have GPS data which shows that we're undergoing a three-dimensional expansion on the Earth. And you can get graphs of the GPS data, and they show you uh, where what the expansion rate is at different places on the Earth. It's not always perfectly uniform, but it's close to that. And uh, so, uh, so anyway, so we have all that type of uh, uh, data. So uh, I just wanted to let you know about the coral reef data and also the uh, U.S. Navy sonar data, and uh, that data, by the way, they don't allow to be put in textbooks because no. it's a, considered a security risk when you're underneath the ocean. Uh, you want to know where the obstacles are if you're in a submarine or something like that, and without this map, you can't be sure what's ahead of you except by using sonar, but they, this right. can uh, see farther. I didn't know they put submarines right near the bottom, but um, I know that they, they don't tell you half of what they do there. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's a military secret, so what some of the things they do. Yeah, but God it, knows what they're up to. I wanted to let you know that there is know. a lot of data now for the three-dimensional expansion of the Earth. Well, yes, I agree with what you're saying, Bill. I've, I think I've seen the um, results that show that the Earth spin was different in the uh, in the distant past um um but um what was i going to say um i'm not going to talk about that right now i was going to talk about some um, new ideas that i had that i haven't really seen um, in any of the other sort of literature about the growing earth so i just thought it'd be a new idea for everybody but yes i, I agree with what you were saying um right so let's just where we got to yes so what i'm going to say is that um because that the um we're going to assume that the earth is expand uh, is growing the earth's surface is growing and you've got the sort of features uh very local uh um regions i mean I, I mean it's it's all around us so um let's just see what i've got here all right yeah so you sort of start you start trying to rationalize what's actually happening uh, in the earth and uh, what's appearing at the surface. And uh, the first thing you think is, well, the mantle fluid from the, um, it, it, no, that you think about the mid ocean rifts, because that's what we've uh, sort of been taught. And you, um, you think, all oh, right, so it's the mantle fluid coming up to the surface, to the mid ocean rift and, uh, you know, forming rock, it's, it's cooling down because it's hot, it's forming rock, and uh, that's how it's working there. Um, but, you know, when when you try and fit that in wheel to what I was saying, that expansion has to be uh, all over the Earth, you've got to think, well, um, well, is it the same? You, you, the immediate assumption is it's the same process. Uh, it's the same mantle fluids coming up uh, just all over the surface. Uh, that's all on the ocean floor and also uh, on the continent. And and it got me um, when I was trying to fit this into um, my way of thinking um, into in, into just a sort of consistent model with what we see. Uh, the first thing you've got to sort of um, fit in because if I, if I'm saying that yes, it's the same fluid mantle that's coming up to the tectonic plates, um, well, the, you think it's really hot, so you, you think oh okay, so let's look at volcanoes. They they produce Using hot fluid to the um, surface, and that's on the continent, so that fits in okay. Um, but I'm saying no; it's even more local than that. You can any bit of countryside, you can look out the window, and you should be able to see the growing earth there. Um, so you know you certainly can't fit that into um, into the idea that it's all hot magma, all the stuff that's coming to the top. So um, you know, by deduction, we have to say, okay, it's not magma, it's something else. What else is it coming up as? So, you know, what is this mantle fluid coming up as? And um, I, I'm going to conjecture here. I don't know if I, this is how I did it when I was thinking in my own mind, but 
um, to the point of argument here, I'm going to conjecture that the mantle fluid coming up is just um, sort of what you'd think of as hot mineral salt water or very saturated minerals. It's come up from the mantle where it's uh, it's hot and pressurized, and it's uh, hot water, and it, when it's pressurized, can uh, dissolve pretty much most things. It's a it's a effectively a strong acid, as good as uh, you know hydrochloric or sulfur sulfuric at um, atmospheric pressure. When yeah, when it's at um, <clears throat> high pressure, it'll min it'll dissolve all the minerals, and then if it if it's coming up to the surface from the mantle, when it gets here, it'll it'll dump all these minerals everywhere. And it doesn't have to be magma, it doesn't have to be melted rock, it can just be hot water um, coming up and cooling, you know, at, uh, gradually. And when it when it gets to a certain point, uh, an arbitrary point, depending on the local environment, it will dump those minerals into the rock and um, add, add more rock to the crust. So I'm saying that's what's... That's what's uh, go, going on pretty much everywhere where you look. Um, so, you know, it, but you, you um, there's not that many places where you can go to see that, but you can. Um, uh, I can try and navigate and show you a few pictures of one, but there's, um, does anybody know about Fly Geyser in, I think it's in Nevada in America, where, um, and this is just one, this is just one example of many where, where um, where there's just mineral water coming out the ground and it's just forming a lot of new rock, not just a little bit, but a whole sort of um, geographic or geologic formation. And um, it really impressed me. And I thought, you know, this this is the expansion. This is the growth of the earth, really. And we're seeing it in, in an everyday context. Uh, I mean, I've, I've got a lot of pictures on my little um, forum. <coughs> That, uh, that that I collected a lot when I when I realised this that's what this was um, this is what was happening I went out and started collecting sort of mineral um, what do you call them mineral fountains or something I'm not very good at terminology I keep on having to invent it as I go along um, but there's mineral fountains um, there uh, there is places where mud's coming out of the ground as well because this you know um, it can come out in different gradations of thickness and things, and and you know that's the sort of that's the first step. You, that's like um, the first step away from volcanoes is uh, when looking for all this mantle fluid. Is yes, you can you can say mud, and we can say mineral um, fountains are um, are another sort of feature of the growing earth that you can see on the continents and everywhere. Well, well, no. That you can't see them anywhere, but they're more common than volcanoes. Um, so how does that sit with everybody? Because uh, that that upsets quite a few geologists. Because when they say, when I say that to them, they say, "Oh no, that's that sort of like mineral, that sort of crust, existing crust that's been um, dissolved, and then and then it's uh, remineralizing somewhere else." And they say, "Oh, you can't, you can't do that. You can't." You can't say this uh, mineral water that's so common is is coming from the mantle because we know it's coming from the rest of the surface. Uh, so um, if you want to say that, say it now, and, uh, and let's see if uh, I can generate some counterpoints to what you think. See what everybody's saying? So uh, <laughs> you're, you're, you're explaining um, that what you're seeing coming out of the ground through geysers is is adding to the i'm not understanding it's adding to the size of the earth i'm, I'm not understanding oh right um well um you know there are um let me just think of uh, if, I, if i get you a picture from um from my uh, uh forum I've got some pictures. Um, geography, geology. There's a place in Turkey where there's a lot of um, travertine. You get these huge travertine. Um, here we go. Limestone, creation of limestone. Limestone is travertine. You see these pictures I've got up. 
It's uh, Paul McHale in Cappadocia in Turkey. I don't know if I can pronounce Turkish uh, names right. But there's these enormous mineral formations in Turkey and uh, they're, all, they're all created by minerals jumping out the ground and uh, it goes on for thousands of years, if not hundreds of thousands of years. And you get these enormous rock pools and, um, you know, very, very pretty sculpted landscapes. And I'm saying that all this mineral jumping out the ground, that is all mantle fluid that has made its way up through the continental crust and is coming out at the top as a fountain. And then the, um, the, um, it's, it, it's coming up as fluid, but then the fluid is precipitating limestone. And so you get these big limestone formations that are uh, effectively new crust. Um, and so you can say, yeah, that, that's where the earth has literally grown. Uh, well, the surface has literally gr grown. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, yeah, I got it. Uh, yeah. The, the uh, from the Navy seems to indicate that the Earth has expanded approximately 70% in radius. Um, would this process allow uh, that big an expansion or... Uh, it looks like the oceans have formed from the division of continents. And, uh, um, and of course, there are cracks in all of the continents where water like this could come up. But uh, is, is this the, what you're suggesting as the primary method for the uh, expansion of the, of the Earth? Yes, yes, it, uh, I think so. Yes, Bill. But the thing is, um, I think... Uh, when you were speaking earlier, you s talked about um, the Earth's mass was expanding. Um, I don't know if it's this is. I don't know um, if you were get, trying to get across that the the Earth's mass stays the same and then expands. But um, I, um, if that's the case, I, I don't think like I don't have the same idea. I think that the actual mass of the Earth is increasing, and it's increasing internally. Um, so to answer your question, could it grow by 70%? The answer is yes. It could grow uh, 100% or 200%. Uh, in fact, if, if you've got um, something that's increasing the mass inside the Earth, it can just go on and on and on. And uh, on my site, I speculate that the Earth can grow to the size of Jupiter and then bigger and become a star. And that's potentially the uh, future of the Earth. Uh, but certainly if you don't agree that the Earth's mass is gaining, then then that's absurd. That can't happen. It can only get so big, and then um, it won't get any more. But um, uh, to uh, to say why I think the Earth's mass is increasing very rapidly as well, it's um, increasing by about two million tons a second. Uh, I think when you do the calculations, um, to, to get into why that 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 is um, quite a a difficult lecture. I don't know if I could give that now, but that's definitely something I'd like to get across. But I wasn't going to talk about that now. <laughs> so, have you ever looked at the GPS data to see what the rate of expansion is? Um, I've certainly looked at um, articles that quote the GPS data. Um, the problem I have with that is that I know that GPS data, if you actually want to verify it and decide for yourself if it's correct it's extremely involved it uh, it requires a very good understanding of uh, radio networking and uh, and satellites i don't think the satellites uh, do as much as people give credit for them uh, i think they're very hyped in the media what the satellites do they from what i gather they just uh, sort of assist with the timing they verify the timing uh, but most of the um, very careful um, precision sort of um, measurements of stations on the earth that is actually done by just radio stations communicating with each other because when you've got a radio station you can fit any amount of very uh, sophisticated large amounts of sophisticated uh, location uh, machinery and you can point them at each other and they can they can uh, you know um, 
sort of uh, locate each other very accurately. You can't really do that when the satellites, which are, I think, about 20,000, um, no, about 13,000 miles up in the sky, and they're moving very quickly. It's just impractical to get very precise data from the satellite. But um, yeah, so GPS data, um, I just, I take it with a pinch of salt, but I, I choose to believe it now. And I do base a, a few of my ideas on the GPS data. Uh, and that's, I, I, I came up with the figure of two, 20 millimeters a year for the Earth's annual radial expansion. Yeah. And, um, and I base that on GPS data. So in that sense, yes, I have looked at it. Okay. Okay, so um, I'll just, if everybody's on board with this idea that, A, you've got, you know, we're, we're, I'm trying to um, get across to you the everyday sort of uh, expansion and growth features you can see on the Earth, and A, we've got the mid-ocean rifts, B, we've got volcanoes, and now I'm saying C, there's mineral fountains as well. They are, that is actual growing Earth material. That's new crust, and it's come from the mantle. So that's three things, but... Uh, James, this is David. I'm sorry to interrupt. Just want to make sure you okay. got you, you're 45 minutes in, okay? All right. Yes. And how long have we got? Well, uh, we we got until two o'clock, uh, two o'clock our time, which would be uh, I think seven o'clock your time. You just want to All time. Right. Um, I just wanted. I I don't mean to interrupt, but I want you to be aware so you can time it so that I think you can have some discussion at the end. I think oh, yes, going to maybe like another 20 minutes. I think would be good. That gives 40 minutes. Okay. Uh, uh, half an hour normally goes by pretty fast. So if you can try that, I'm just, just I'm sorry about that, but I think that no, would be that's fine. That's fine. Um, it's a okay. learning process. No problem. Um, no problem. I'm on. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, right. Um, so yeah, three things: uh, ocean rifts, volcanoes, and these mineral out outcrops, out um, fountains. Uh, but those still are not really what you see when you look out your window every day. So where else can we see the growing earth in uh, everyday um, experience? So let me just see. Okay, I think I'll bring up my pictures now. Um, right, I'm hoping you can see um, a picture of the Devil's Tower. Um, I don't know if that's come up well on, on your screen, but I've got a nice picture of... Um, it's a it's a, a funny kind of mountain. I don't know what you call it. Is it tall enough to be a mountain? It's a an outcrop of rock in America called Devil's Tower. And um, in fact, I, I don't, I'll um, I'll move to another picture. Okay, that's better. Yeah, let's move to Devil. We'll go to Devil's Tower later. But I want to look at this one now. Um, so. What 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 do you see here? When if you look at that, what do you what do you think causes this? Uh, I mean, what is it? It looks like a sort of muddy mountain. There's some mountains in the back, and yet this is it looks sort of uh, like a a small mountain, but it seems to be made out of mud. So how do you think that's come to? What what sort of geologic process put that there? Uh, do you want anybody want to have a go at answering that, or shall I just tell you what I think? <laughs> Well, one of the th ways that we we you know talk about mountain building and the expanding Earth is, is that you have a crust that's much more curved, and when you uncurve a more curved sur surface, it ends up buckling. That's a uh, general. Oh yeah. Thing. Yeah, that was. Um, I first heard that theory from James Maxlow. It's the Stone Bridge theory, isn't it? Um, that. Um, the curvature is a lot greater on the small earth and uh, when it grows bigger the whole thing collapses and you get sort of buckled mountain thing um well yes that is one theory and and it does make sense but yes certainly here i'm going to offer a completely different explanation i'm going to say that this can you all see uh, this sort of brown mountain thing then? i don't i don't know yeah, if anybody can see the same picture yeah. i'm looking at oh good um so yeah, I'm just going to say that that is a um, another mineral fountain, basically, uh, and certainly it looks like one to me. Uh, but you know, where, where's the, if it's a mineral fountain, where's the water? Well, I'm going to say the water is 
it is there it's just not getting to the surface and that is what i'm going to assert that this is what a mineral fountain looks like when a, when the water doesn't get to the surface but it's still precipitating the minerals and the minerals um you know just pile up uh, as you see them now um so if you accept that you've basically got a, a mechanism a way of growing hills um which which i'd never heard of before but i it just sort of seemed uh, normal to me uh, i mean uh, seemed logical to me i can just show you a few other pictures of of uh, features ge geographic features which i think are mineral outcrops mineral fountains i have to get better with my terminology but this is uh, i've got a picture of um, the desert i think it's in egypt now uh, can everybody see that Anybody see it? Yes. Yes. Oh, good. Okay. I, I definitely need a guess after every uh, picture upload because uh, if, if I'm going on about a picture and you can't see it, then, then uh, that's no good. But yeah, just I'll be definitely get a yes in uh, after every picture. So yeah, we've got a picture of Egypt, and um, I'm going to say again that that is a mineral uh, out um, mineral fountain. There's water coming up um, from from the mantle. It's getting somewhere near the surface and um, it's not getting to the top, but it's depositing new minerals. So, um, you know, if you just see a bump like that in the middle of nowhere in the, in the Egyptian desert, then um, you've got, I, I, I'd assert that that is, uh, if you were to dig a hole down into the middle of it, you'd find a lot of sort of mineral rich water. Um, you wouldn't really be able to see what it's doing, but there'd be a lot there. And and you'd find if you dug a hole, then all the the walls would start to mineralize. So that's uh, just another picture. Let's see. All right, this is one of my favourites. Does anybody know what this film is from? This picture. What film this picture is from? Anybody can see the picture. Lawrence of Arabia. Yay! That's a really good film. I love that film. Do you like it? It's one of my favourite films, and um, and it just happens to have very uh, nice geologic uh, features in in it as well. Um, and yeah, that my eyes are just drawn immediately to that uh, pyramid kind of um, not what you call it. Well, just a mineral fountain again. It looks so so much like a man. But uh, if so, uh, but, um, there must be a a geological reason for that, a reason for it existing. Um, and I say that's a mineral fountain. Again. Um, okay, so you, you're not getting the point that I'm making, but um, let's just just for. Um, what um, eventually is the reason for that thing is, uh, we need to okay, so uh, how professional uh, explain that do you think I don't know if you go at that how if geology classes that pyramid um, exist because of the sedimentary theory anybody want to go Okay, no takers. I'll, I'll I'll try and explain it the way I learnt it at school. Is that there was a higher, there was lots of sediments all building up, and uh, and the, millions of years ago, it all built up. Perhaps it was different uh, climates and things, and uh, um, lots of rivers. There were there were a lot of rivers around, and they all deposited this uh, shale substance, uh, shale rock, and then all that geology finished, and the desert came along and the rock started to wear away and then you end up with uh, these relics uh, these relics of the past and what you're seeing there is a, a sedimentary relic um and there is some logic to that but i i just fell out with that idea because um i was just seeing these things far too much uh, it's difficult to explain why um i don't think i'd better get into my um 
dissatisfaction with sed with conventional sedimentary theory, other than that, that it prompted me to create my own theory. Um, let's see, I want to find a good picture. Oh, by the way, this, uh, yeah, this, I mean, can you see this? It sort of looks like a sea with um, smoke coming out of it. Does anybody know what it actually is? This is in Indonesia. Well, I'll tell you. It's... Sorry, go ahead. Was that a... Well, I think I'm giving feedback there, right? There's a problem with the sound. Can Sorry, you hear could me? you say again? I think it's called a karst, K-A-R-S-T. Karst? Oh, yeah. what's that? What's that? It's a hot mineral formation, perfectly circular, like that filled with mineral water that spills over the edges and deposits. I th yes, I think it is a cast. But um, the, the point is, uh, I mean, the, the most striking point is it's the Indonesian... Um, there was an accident in Indonesia where some mining company drilled into the ground and uh, they were looking for oil and they drilled into the ground and all the oil just shot out the ground. Uh, not the oil, this mud shot out the ground. You and think it this created a man-made structure? Um, the, um, it is a bit man-made. What they're trying to do is trying to control it. All that mud is... Um, all that mud is leaping out the ground, what you're actually seeing was what used to be a bit of a city and the mud just came and washed it all away and it now looks like a sea. Oh, wow. uh, but this company just flooded this whole city in Java. And I think it's been going on since 2006. It's been flowing all this mud everywhere for um, oh, where 14 years. Hang on a sec. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute. <laughs> So, I mean, the point is that this, all this minerals just come up from out the ground. Uh, and what on earth could be supplying so much mud that uh, it floods a whole city and turns it into what looks like a sea? Um, you know, th this idea that, oh, it's some old sediments that have got washed around and uh, are now under the ground and uh, are just, um, you know, it's, it's the crust recycling itself. I, I don't, it doesn't quite uh, explain it's a bit of a weak explanation i'd rather say that that uh, only the mantle can just just pour out such a prodigious uh, prodigious amount of um uh, mud that it can just make a sea out of a city so I'd, I'd say that's sort of supporting evidence of um what i'm saying is that the everywhere you look there is um mantle fluid coming up um okay i mean um so what i'm going to try and do now is just extend this to hills and mountains in general is that whenever you see a hill stack uh, or a mountain what is actually happening it's it's um it's not a relic from the past a mountain isn't uh a, i mean they're old but the, i wouldn't say they're sort of um old dying things that are um slowly decaying there's a really good picture so that I must must show you. I don't think um, I'll have to go to off the I'll have to get off these pictures. I want to show you a feature called Factory Butt in um, I think it's in Utah, America again. Let me just see if I can find it. It's on my forum. It's just about the best picture I've got to illustrate this point, if I can find it. Okay, I think I'm going to find it here. It's, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, so I've got it on my page. I don't know if you can see it on yours. Um, can everybody see it? Yes. Okay. So this is a factory butt. It's, yeah, it is what it looks like. It's just a big feature that sticks out the ground in the desert in Utah, I think. It's somewhere in the American desert. And um, I think this is a good point, um, a, a good feature that exemplifies what I'm saying and is quite a counterpoint to the conventional theory that these these features are old relics from the past that are uh, eroding into the um, 
desert and quite soon they'll be gone. I'm saying no, they're not they're not doing that. They are active and they are producing uh, they are um, manifests of uh, mantle fluid coming to the surface and pouring out all this what what looks like sand and soil um, and it's it's active now and it's not going to go away. And um, I think it's a good counterpoint because um, sedimentary, conventional sedimentary theory will tell you that's eroding away. And we have just got lucky. We have got lucky to see that in its current state because for millions of years, it was a huge mesa, you know, a, a big tabletop. Uh, and it's been eroding, getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so it's now just a sort of, it is just a sort of line, a big line, but it's it's quite soon in its own lifetime, it's going to be, uh, gone and just blown away in the sand and and i mean that makes sense but you do have to say oh we've got lucky we've got lucky to see it in its current state because if we were around 10 millions of years ago it'd be a big measure and if we were around 10 million years in the future it'd be gone um so it's like a a lucky snapshot in its lifetime um according to conventional theory but i'm saying no that's that's a permanent feature it's been like that for a long time and again i'll say the thing that's sustaining it, it is uh, growth of the earth which is um mantle fluid coming up um up through the continental crust and producing that feature that you see there it is it's mineral being deposited by uh, minerals being deposited by um mantle fluid which just drops all this uh, stuff onto the surface um so i think i mean that's the strongest point i've got really so i'll add how long have we got should i go on for another 10 minutes david make a few more points uh, absolutely uh, it's, it's a it's a 110 or it's yeah 10 so you have 10 minutes okay well i'm just gonna I just scrolled up to look at mount connor in australia and i think that's another um, case in point is that it's uh, an old mesa and um, you, you can say this is a relic from the past it's all dying uh, and soon it'll be gone but I'm I'm going to say no that's an active feature that is uh, growth uh, that's happening right now and it's pouring out uh, this new stuff that is adding to the um, adding to the crust um, and you can look, you can look around the earth, and you can see all these measures, butts, and spires. And uh, to me, it all looks the same. It's an active feature, and you can just imagine it. It's uh, uh, you know, if it was a small experiment you're doing, you you could imagine sort of sand popping out of uh, a fountain that you uh, uh, made in your own backyard or something, and it would sort of look like that. The sand would be spilling out. Um, I mean, the reason why it's, there's all this rock, I mean, you've got this nice soft sand and you can sort of uh, think to yourself, yes, that's minerals pouring out, but why is this, this rock at the top? Um, and that is because that is, um, that is minerals that is coming out of the um, mantle, but it's, it's um, precipitating. It's, it's coming out of the water. That's... Um, at a, a lower, um, it's, it's, it's at a higher pressure, lower down the ground. And if, if it precipitates lower down, it, it comes out as rock rather than uh, dust or, um, or shale or something. Uh, and, you know, and that's a, a general rule. That's uh, the, the lower down the minerals precipitate, they're going to be, they're going to form harder and harder rock. So when you get something like this, you've got, so you can say, that this mesa, it's been formed quite low in the ground, uh, low enough to crush the um, new material into rock. And then, then there's more material comes up that it, it pushes the existing stuff up and you get this um, I don't know, ladder effect where rock is pushing more rock up and you get a nice mesa. But as well as that, there's, um, you know, there's material that get quite higher up and, and that doesn't form rock, it, it forms dust instead. Um, and uh, yeah, now I've got a picture of, a small picture of what I think is a relic, one that really has died and has stopped producing because there's no dust on it. 
And I do think that rock will erode now. I don't know if you can see that picture, but there we go. And that this is a small one. This is a, a small one that's just started in the ground. I think you could actually take a, a shovel to that and um, whack it and you'd find there's salt and there's water. It's a bit, you know, and it's just in the desert. Although I might be a bit, being a complete fool, that might be a man-made one. I'm not completely sure because I know that's what's when they when they do salt mining extraction in the desert, you end up with bumps like that. So I don't know. I could be wrong. Uh, the spires. I'm just trying to. Okay. Okay. Now this is a, a picture that interests me, and I've, I've posted it a few times. But uh, can everybody see this? This one's important to me. It's the Bentonite Hills outside of Capitol Reef National Park in Utah. Um, assuming you can see this, excuse me. Uh, this is very striking to me because that the amount of scree coming off of this uh, spire and rock formation generally is completely out of proportion to um, the size of the spire uh, according to conventional theory. Um, you know, because conventional theory is, oh, scree is the rock crumbling. Scree is the rock uh, turning to dust and then coming away from the mountainside. Well, that, that just looks completely out of proportion. How can that little spire be producing all that scree? In fact, there's an enormous amount of muck and uh, mud just coming off of this um, formation in the background. Um, so to me, that just supports my theory saying um you know by saying yes there's you're correct there's there's not enough um set, there's not enough rock there to produce so much sediment so the alternative theory is true that this is new stuff this is fountaining out of the ground and it's it's pouring out like a fountain um and it's not proportional to the size of the little spire you know, I mean, at that rate, if if, going, if we are going to assume it's sediment, uh, conventional theory is correct, then that spire should be gone in the next 10 years. I mean, the, the amount of scree coming off of it is enormous. It's much bigger than the spire itself. And yet the, the scree is coming out right near the top of the spire. You know, it's like you could go there every year and the spire would, would have crumbled a lot more. But um, what I'd really like to find is a picture of this spire 50 years ago. And if it's still in the same shape, roughly the same shape it is now, uh, I'd say that is as close to falsifying conventional sedimentary theory as as I can think of, really. I think this is one of my best, strongest points. I'm just missing, at the moment, a picture of this feature 50 years ago. Uh, does, so I'd, I'd like to ask everybody here, don't you, do you agree with this? Do you think this is a good point that, I, uh, that I'm stuck on, you know, in my own head? I think it's a good point. Um, this, is this is David. Um... The other explanation, I, when I look at it, and I don't, again, I'm not a geologist, but it could be that those kind, that that kind of, that material there is very plastic. It's not really loose. I mean, you can see that people are driving up with 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 a you know a very heavy and violent equipment. It seems to stay sick. It's almost like clay. Could it be another explanation that it's not? That it's just a lot there, but it, it just stays that way for a very long time. When when it sheds, it just builds because it's sticky and it's thicker. I, I'm I'm not I'm not a geologist, but is that a possible other explanation? Uh, it's not what I've heard of. Um, scree is doesn't usually stick. It usually does. Uh, from what I know, it does slide away relatively quickly compared to the life of the rock. So. Um, I, I, I would say no, that, that's not something I'd consider unless somebody would show me a good example of, um, that sort of demonstrates that. Uh, so I, I do think there's too much scree there and it should, it should blow away in the wind, you know, over a matter of hundreds or thousands of years. So, and the fact that it's uh, like this now, I think it, it, it sedimentary theory isn't very correct. Hi there, this is Jean again. Um, I, I live in the southwest um, and in New Mexico, and those slopes, I would guess, would be a extremely fine 
clay-like material. Um, if you look at the mm. Vistai, Vistai Badlands in uh, New Mexico. Mm. Oh, yes, are, it looks just like this, really, but my thinking. Yeah, okay, so that's an extremely fine material, whereas a scree slope out here in the southwest, you would see very high in the mountains, you know, big boulders and stuff. Or you would see it uh, tumbling, you know, down like you you, sh you showed Devil's Tower. Around yes, Devil's I did. Tower, around Devil's Tower is definitely a scree slope. Um, but yeah, this is a that's all big stuff coming up. Here. Yeah, this is extremely fine material. Um, right. So you agree that it shouldn't last that long? It shouldn't be blown away by the wind and the rain, in like a hundred or a thousand years. Uh, well, yeah, I think it's more prone to being eroded than than a lot of things. Uh, I have a whole different. I mean, I agree with expansion tectonics for sure. Yeah. But I, I also am a catastrophist, so you know, I, I look at electrical forces and things like that, and orbital mechanics, and lots of different right. things. Um, oh, I, I, we probably disagree a bit there because um, yeah, I, I try to avoid catastrophe when I can. Oh, well, I do too. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's not my own life, but um, explaining things because with a catastrophe, you can have um, you can make anything happen. You know, you can just oh, change no, the scene no, and I everything. No, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not a loose cannon. Okay. <laughs> Well, yes, it's a sort of special card where you can just uh, completely change the environment. Oh, isn't that cheating a bit? Try, try and avoid catastrophes. That's my mantra. Yeah, well, that's, you know, that's human lives. I'm talking about geology right now. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, yes, we've got to speculate. Yeah, I'm going to mute myself. Uh, James, I have a, a question. I'm sort of still not getting some part of this, and maybe I'm just a ding dong. But um, are you saying that these things are being pushed up from the bottom? Yes. That I mean, that and that's another thing that annoys uh, conventional geologists because they like to think, um, you know, the new material comes from the top. And actually, I think a lot of cases uh, it is new material from the top. But I'm saying you've got to be open to uh, certainly. In some of the ones I've shown you, um, it can come up from the top. It, you know, there's no when the water's coming up from the mantle. There's no rule that says you can only uh, precipitate your minerals when you get to the top. If the water gets stuck halfway up and then begins to uh, dry out, so to speak, then the, the minerals will precipitate uh, where they are. So you can have the minerals coming out the top in the middle or, or very low down the earth. Uh, the point is the below down. The minerals precipitate. They they will become um, rocks, and the further lower down, they'll become harder rocks. Uh, the funny thing is, I mean, one thing I sort of um, noticed that it's is that dust, soft rocks and hard rocks, they're all the same elements. They're just you know more squashed together the further down you go. So it's the same stuff. It's the same. Uh, broadly speaking, it's the same. Of course, there's lots of different rocks lots of different elements in the rocks but um most most of the rocks are same elements but in different chemical arrangements and and what's decided that is um a, a lot of it is how far down in the earth that these um elements precipitate from water and, and form dry rock um, um, so does that answer the question yeah, no, no, it's getting more, but okay, another one is if they're being pushed up and they're in layers, um, it seems like you could do carbon dating. Are you saying that the layers below are are, are younger? Uh, yeah, good point. Um, that's what a few people say to me, you know, um, they, they say, you can't say this because we've got carbon dating of these rocks and, you know, we, we found that the uh, lower ones are older and the higher ones are younger and that's back to front well, what i'm saying i'm saying that you know it's new it's coming out of the ground so the newest ones in the uh, lower down um so if that's the point you're making um 
it's a good point. But when I look at radiocarbon dating, it's something it's something I never really need to address. But I, I've been to quite a few sites where they just say it's all over the place. Radiocarbon dating is a is a big mess and it's very inconsistent. Um, and uh, trying to sort of um, say, oh, this if you're trying to age uh, from with regard to its height, I, I think there's a, a case to make that um, that um, it, it's not it's not strictly true. It's that definitely I completely agree that there's some rocks that I've got good um, carbon dating and are. Uh, Everyone agrees, including me, that the oldest rocks are at the bottom and the youngest are at the top. Uh, but it's not a general rule, and people have tried to apply it, and it's sort of come off the, the rails where people have tried to do that. And, 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 and I'd argue it's not because of some anomalous uh, teething uh, problem. It's, it's actually an underlying – there's a, a bigger underlying problem in, is that – there are formations where the youngest rocks are at the bottom and not at the top. And, you know, it's, it's a bit of a gray area because people will try and explain it away with a lot of uh, strange terms. I don't understand. And uh, I keep it simple. If, if, um, if the rocks at the bottom are younger and can be explained by this simple idea, I'd, I'd, I'd rather take that than um, a complicated explanation involving uh, radio isotopes. It's something I need to look into. It's quite a, an involved subject is uh, radio, um, radio carbon dating, but, you know, radio element dating in general. Um, I'd like to look at that more this year. Um, does that answer the point? I think I rambled on a bit there. No, 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 that's OK. Uh, I'm just trying to understand because one of the things I always do is try to understand what the person's trying to say, because it's easy to jump to conclusions. Um, I did read a book. I, I was also when I was doing the uh, you got to uh, expansion tectonics. I read I, I said I need to read a book. I read a good book. I don't know. can't remember the title of it, but it's on it's dating rocks. And I ordered it from Amazon probably oh, eight, eight, nine years ago. But um, another question would be um, along the same lines. Uh, a couple of questions. One is, are you saying that all the rock processes are this way or are, are there mixed processes that you got this kind of process in one place and another kind of process in another, like buckling is in one, pushing up is in another? Um, I'd say it, this is a sort of general, uh, a general um, mechanism you can use to explain all the other ones. So yes, you can still have a lot of conventional rock mechanic uh, rock creation mechanisms but i'm saying this this it's a broad brushing spread that you can say about most rocks pretty much all of them there's always exceptions but most of them are created by mantle fluid coming up from the ground and uh precipitating and and uh, you know you can you can pretty much see that in most rocks so does that explain it? Um, I mean, if if you if you want to sort of point out a, a rock creation process that you're thinking of, I might be able to tell you, you know, in what way that that is fits in with my idea about mantle fluid coming up from the mantle. No, I understand. Uh, the one that, of course, you know, I know is the ones I've read about from you know uh, Samuel Warren Carey and um, James Maxlow, and that is, and, and some of the proof sort of for it that I, I sort of see as very strong evidence for is the actual continents where you have, I think this is in um, uh, Carrie's book um, that that is uh, what's it called, it's called uh, Theories of the Earth and Universe, A History of the Dogma of the Earth Sciences, you know, a pretty classic book by Carey. And, and in there he shows these diagrams of all the um, uh, continents where if you if you take them from a curved surface to a less curved surface, they tend to buckle on the coasts. So if you look at the United States, you've got mountains on the west coast and you have mountains on the east coast, and not too many in the mid, in the middle. Um, and other continents look to be the same. So that that idea seems at least that very big uh, kind of pattern seems to be repeated in itself uh, across you know continents. So that's the one thing I was you know, uh, 
I, I it's it makes sense to me. I mean, uh, yeah. And and then the other thing again with the carbon dating, you, you know, I did read about that. So, you know, you have to, you do need to know about that. But if um, if it's all pushing up, I mean, in in, in that idea that you're saying, if carbon mm. dating has problems, that you know, that's how you explain. Well, why is it people think they're dating, uh, you know, top uh, younger and, and bottom older? Uh, the other thing is, is that if it's if it's more localized, then you can say, well, it's being pushed up over here, but not over there. Uh, the other the other question I had for the second question I had was, um, if this is pushing up through the mantle, like those formations you saw with it sloughing off, sort of, um, those layers should be sort of replicated further below, shouldn't they, or or not? It's, it's pushing up in a place. It's sort of like a hot spot. Is that in my understanding what you're saying? Is that what it is? A hot spot, and if it does push it up, then it's create it's creating those layers at that, or is it is it a process that's non-uniform or uniform? Uh, that part was another question I had. Well, yeah, okay. I'll answer the second one first. Um, the sort of process of how the mantle fluid gets to the surface, it's you, you think of it just as um, as you would in, in your garden if you had a, a cracked concrete um, surface, just concrete that's all cracked up and fragmented, and there's water seeping up underneath it. Um, so, um, you know that that in essence is everything you need to know really, and from that you can. Um, uh, just sort of deduce that you know you're going to get uh, formations like um, hills and mountains where the cracks in the existing concrete exist. You can you can sort of model the whole of the earth as as a rock, a fragmented, highly fragmented surface with with uh, fluid in between the cracks, and this fluid is mantle fluid. Um, but more than that, the it's the fluid pressure from the expanding earth from the mantle which is producing all this fluid that is cracking the um, the surface of the earth so it, it'll fluid will come up from the mantle to the crust it'll form new rock and then you've got more fluid um, coming up underneath that and now if there's any rock that won't uh, yield that isn't permeable then that rock will fragment as well uh, and it's just an ongoing uh, process like that um and that, that that when i when i sort of got that in my head i sort of said to myself well that explains the whole earth really you can just apply that to any part of the earth and that explains the geology there it's just uh, water coming up uh, cracking the earth and um, finding ways to get in and precipitating minerals uh, and then the process can do it again and again and again end up with very cracked varied um, crust because of all these intrusions you know that's a conventional term I should use that more often uh, uh, intrusion of mantle fluid, just uh, pressuring the crust, breaking it up, and um, I just thought, yeah. I, I looked at the map of the Earth, and I just said, oh, that makes sense to me now. I, I understand what I'm looking at when I looked at the world map. You know, when I was younger, they'd uh, they put the world map in front of you, and you just couldn't, you could just couldn't, it didn't make any sense. You know, you, you looked at the continents, you couldn't really see a pattern other than that some of them fit together, but you were like thinking, what am I looking at? Why, why does doesn't this look like um, the icebergs? You know, they sometimes make an uh, analogy that continents are icebergs floating around, bumping into each other. Um, if you actually go and look on um, uh, Google Images of what icebergs look like when they're bumping into each other, they look nothing like uh, the world map. You know, so um, so it's this. It's a surface that's cracking and new fluid coming up and forming new crust, and I just it just makes sense to me. The, that's what it looks like. Uh, does that answer the second part of the question? What's it? What you're asking? Can you remember what the first question was again? Because well, I, I think I was uh, talking uh, about maybe matching it to whether the surfaces around that is it's coming up in only certain places. So it's not the entire plateau that's lifting; it's only certain areas. That was my other question. Well, the thing is, you know, when when the surface cracks, it cracks fairly unevenly. So, um, you're saying it, it's does it explain it locally? I, you know, there are places where there'll be a large chunk of earth that's for some local reason didn't crack. Um, is that what you mean? Do you mean um, does it explain 
Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's that's why I was because obviously you see those spires because the conventional explanation is that those things are basically you know road just what's left, right? They, they, so. they think of them as relics in conventional theory, but no, I think they're active features. I mean, uh, they're not all active. You know, uh, water's flowing up from the earth, but for some reason that particular supply, there will be a kind of a myriad maze of water um, fractures pumping water up from the mantle and you know they might get cut off because of uh, rock falls or something uh, and I, I showed you earlier what a rock formation that's been cut off from its mineral supply looks like and all the dust and debris has been blown off and you're left with a kind of skeletal looking uh, rock formation uh, and you know I do think that will fall to pieces quite uh, quite soon I mean um, I think when, when I start to think these thoughts, uh, I realize that rock formations uh, are quite temporal. You know, they're not going to last more than a million years, probably more like 100,000 years before the wind just blows them away. If the, the minerals from the earth, the, the supplies cut off. So I began to see things like the spires in Utah I was looking at earlier. Uh, I see them as quite temporal things. You know, a conventional theory sees them as ancient relics, millions of years old. Uh, I see them as maybe 100,000 years old, maybe a million. No, I wouldn't see them as a million years old myself. You know, the, the, the growing out of the ground and the toppling over a bit and then they grow a bit more and topple over a bit, it all gets blown away. If the minerals stop, then they would be gone uh, in a few hundred thousand years, I'd say. Um, I could be off by the time scale, but only by a factor of 10. That's that's what I'm thinking at the moment. Uh, so, what do you think to that? Um, no, I, I like I said, I always try to uh, understand what uh, somebody said because I've not heard this this idea before. So, right, uh, all right. well, I haven't read about it before, but you know, so many people in history have thought long and hard about geology. I'd I'd like to uh, read somebody else from the past uh, having all these ideas before me because it would. Um, um, it would support my ideas, I think. It helps when other people um, um, agree with you, you know. Sure, sure. Um, uh, I, I guess, uh, are there any, anybody else have any other questions for James? I know we can go into discussion and comments because I know people, one of the things about having these video conferences oftentimes. There's a lot of comments, is there? I'll look at them. Well, yeah, but a lot of times what will happen is you'll get people sort of, starting to tell about what they they think and that's okay um but i usually try to keep it focused to what the person's saying because otherwise then we'll have just mm. basically a lot of small presentations of everybody's ideas of the way they think it works and it's i'm not saying that's a, that's bad but i you know we want to try to keep it um focused at least for you know today's presentation so does anybody have any questions any more questions for james about the you know what he's talking about um, and specifically about that and uh, I'm sure like I said there are other people who have different ideas but again uh, questions specifically about uh, his his presentation and some of his ideas I'd like to ask a question yes go ahead oh yes um, I was wondering if you have any guidelines for discerning between man-made and natural like I find some of these things uh, resembling in archaeology where um, they have tells where a tell may have 10 different cities built one on top of another of another of another and then at the top it is kind of flat not uh, not like coming up, uh, um, you know, magma or uh, anything, you know, n near the surface of the earth. Um, so I, I just, you know, like to be able to discern for myself if the guidelines are there. Uh, did I, sorry, did I understand you correctly, uh, Mr. Powell? Uh, a as yeah, hi. Um, did you say ten stories or ten cities stacking on top of each other? What did you? Yes, say? ten cities. 
I and mean, cities. And cities were only basically two stories at the most. And the one uh, I am thinking of that was, you know, is still being debated is about the uh, exodus uh, from the Bible as to how many cities were built there uh, at Jericho before it was, uh, you know, won over and given back to... Uh, oh, well, that's certainly more archaeology. I, I haven't really looked at archaeology. I mean, you do hear about um, cities being built on top of the ruins of other cities. I, I really haven't looked at that at all, so I I don't think I'm a, a good source to uh, give you any definite information. I can speculate, but um, um, I, everything I've talked about at the moment has, has nothing to do with, to my mind, as far as I know, uh, building cities on top of cities. Um, but... I would imagine it would be very easy to tell a city from um, from the features I've been talking about. I, I, I'm not good at archaeology, but uh, in my mind, I think, oh, I'd, I'd easily be able to tell a city from a um, um, stone formation. Um, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Well, the archaeologists can't tell by looking at the tell how many cities are underneath until they really dig into it. And it takes many, many, many decades, often a century or two or more. Well, actually, no, I think I do have a, a um, I think you're right. I think um, what I'm saying is relevant, actually, because I, I am, I have been pointing out, I've been trying to point out the whole time that, yes, the earth uh, is producing a lot of dust and debris that can, that, that will just sit on top of everything. In fact, that um, Indonesian um, example, the mud, you know, it looks like a sea now. You, you never think there was a city underneath it, but there was. Um, so uh, I think it's, it is plausible, actually, that um, if you build your city uh, at a site where the growing earth decides to um, um, emit a new mineral source that will precipitate a lot of rock or a mud. I mean, um, in the case of Indonesia, it, it's it was pressurized mud. It was it was stuff that had been building up for a long time and uh, needed to pop. And uh, unfortunately, when they drilled there, they let all this mud out and it just jumped out and uh, it was uncontrollable. Um, but yes, you could. A city can be flooded by um, up when upwelling mineral or mud, and uh, you know it would be, you know, roughly fossilized. I don't know if that's the right term, but it would be encased in mud. And then 100 years later, 200 years later, you know, it's still an ideal place. You know, if you're going to build a city in a certain location, then it's still a nice location. So, and muds, you know, you grow all your food in mud, so you would build a city on top of a city. <laughs> and that could happen several times. I mean, over thousands of years, if you've got a nice location next to the sea and it's got lots of new fertile mud, you know, you, that's where you live if you're a farmer. So. Um, uh, from what I've said, it's plausible you could build three or four cities on top of each other like that, but I really haven't looked into it at all. It'd be very interesting to look. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm guessing that there's cities built on top of cities once, but I've, I've never heard of a city built on top of a city, built on top of a city three times, you know. Uh, I'd be interested if you've got examples of that, actually. Uh, is that okay? Yes, thank you, Jim. No problem. Uh, that was quite an interesting one. I, I haven't been asked that one before. <laughs> uh, any other questions? It, it, no worries if you haven't, because I've got plenty more things I can talk about. What kind of time frame do you think we've had the expansion of the Earth occur? Uh, good question. I'd say... Um, it's been expanding for a very long time. Um, as far as, well, this is another point I could have gone into. This is another subject I could have gone into. I think the whole, all the other planets, all the other worlds in the solar system are growing. And when you look at the surfaces of them, you can pick out features that, that uh, are consistent with growing Earth, growing world theory. It's a more, you know, more general term than growing Earth is growing world. 
So you've got all these uh, moons that have um, rifts on them, tectonic rifts. And uh, I think Ganymede, if you've ever looked at Ganymede, uh, Jupiter's moon, then that is a, a beautiful example of uh, a growing world where all the features are apparent just by from a surface um, view. Um, most of the most of the time with moons is is that they're, they're so heavily cratered you can't really see the growth um, features and uh, so that obscures it. I mean, it's in a kind of way it's a shame that they're all cratered because without the craters, I think I think every moon would show very clear um, surface expansion features. I, I did go out my I've got a picture somewhere on my forum. Where I picked out the moons without craters, and you and I think you can see growth formations on them. Um, so what you're asking, how long has the Earth been growing for? I would say a billion years. And building what I'm saying, you can contract it all the way down. If you go backwards in time, the Earth would get smaller down to the size of Mars, and it get then it go down to the size of a moon, and it gets smaller and smaller, and it would keep going. It really would keep going to. Um, the point where you call it a moon moonlet or a, an asteroid. It sounds crazy, but, um, and, you know, if I'm going to say this, does it have implications? Yes, it does. If you look at Saturn now, I'd say I think of Saturn as a, a world factory because it's got those rings and it's producing lots of little moonlets. Those little moonlets are uh, flying off and going into independent orbits. There's, there's a lot of them that are just... Um, I'd think we'll just fly off into outer space because there's too many moons there. Um, but Saturn has the most moons. Uh, they're all different sizes. Um, and, you know, the, the, the planet rings, I'd say, is a, a sort of world nursery, a place where uh, uh, worlds are born and then they um, accumulate a bit of dust and then they start this process, which I haven't talked about today, where they grow mass internally. And they just grow bigger and bigger as worlds. And moons become planets. Planets become what you'd think of as gas giants. And then they become stars. So, you know, the future of every world in the solar system is going to, they're just going to grow. And um, I think the, if you go back a long, long time, then um, the Earth was a, a small asteroid. Um, I would guess. My estimates are quite a bit less than conventional theory, but I'd guess about one or two billion years old is the age of the Earth, and it's been growing ever since it was formed. So, yeah, uh, I mean, um, that, that's not going to sit. If, I don't think that's going to sit uh, well at all with, um, with what you had in mind. Am I correct? Well, I'm a, a physicist, so we measure the age of the Earth radioactively you know, with the decay of uranium and other... Mm. And oh, uh, yeah. what we found is a mistake was made earlier in measuring the age. Uh, the mistake was we had certain minerals that had uranium in them, and we know that uranium decays to lead, and so what we were doing was we were measuring the amount of lead in that mineral and compare it to the amount of still radioactive uh, uranium. And if you assume that that lead came from uranium, that would give you an age of the Earth of three and a half billion years. But right. what we started doing is we started looking at the minerals under a microscope. And we found that the um, radioactive material is in the form of what we call radio halos. As so you have a little bit of a mineral uh, that contains uranium, uh, that when it decays puts out alpha particles. And when the alpha particle goes out, it kind of plows up the mineral and leaves a ring for each type of uh, decay that involves an alpha particle. So this pattern of rings about the central uh, bit of uranium uh, is called a radio halo pattern. Now, you can tell what was in there that was decaying by the number of rings and the radius of the rings in that particular mineral density. And so 
we are able to look at a radio halo pattern and see what it was that we uh, started with. And uh, so when we do that with this mineral that had a lot of uranium in it, we find radio halo patterns for 20 or 30 other radioactive materials that also decay to the same isotope of lead. And uh, so, uh, but they have very short half-lives compared to uranium. So some of them have a half-life of minutes, some months, some years, but not billions of years like uranium. And uh, so what we have done is we have corrected the age measurements of uranium, and we found that it's much, much shorter than, than billions of years. It's not even millions of years, less than that. But then we started looking at other types of decay, like, for instance, carbon-14 is made in the atmosphere by cosmic radiation coming in and hitting nitrogen-14 and converting it to carbon-14. We NASA looked at the rate of production of carbon-14. And that carbon-14 goes into the atmosphere and then into the ocean and also into plants. And so those are considered reservoirs. So the, the question was asked, with the current rate of production uh, and with a half-life of carbon-14 being 28,000 years, uh, would we, we should be at a, a, at a equilibrium. In other words, is the, every uh, reservoir is filled with uh, the carbon-14 because after a while, the production rate <coughs> equals the decay rate and, uh, and they'll be saturated. But we found that wasn't the case. We found that uh, we're only at 50% of the uh, maximum amount of carbon-14 that could exist with the current rate of production in the atmosphere, in the oceans, and in plants. And uh, so, but that's a, a bit based on an assumption that cosmic rays coming in have been fairly constant, or mm -hmm. slightly greater in the past. But uh, so, so anyway, I have done that study. I have uh, 20 different radioactive decay methods for measuring the age of the Earth, and I found that they are all in agreement within their uncertainties that the age of the Earth is between 6 and 12,000 years. I just want to pass that on to you. Uh, a lot of people don't like to hear that, uh, but we can't, we can't justify the old age like we did in the past because we didn't examine the minerals properly. We didn't look at what was going on. We had a way under the microscope to see what is decaying and producing the lead or other decay products. And we don't okay. have left a decay method for measuring the age of the Earth that is longer than this age. Well, that's uh, interesting. So anyway, so that wouldn't give a lot of time for these processes to handle the expansion. That was why I thought that the decay of the force of gravity, just like when you have a balloon, if the if the the rubber on the outside of the balloon gets weaker, like if you let a balloon up into the atmosphere, uh, you know, with uh, like a, a hydrogen in it, it'll go up and eventually pop. Hmm. And uh, so, yes. something like that seems to be what may be happening on the Earth, and of course. In the process of expansion, all these things you're mentioning are also produced, and uh, they're all contributing to it. But the, the real secret seems to be in the expansion marks on the bottom of the ocean, because they can be measured and dated. And so uh, that's what has been done. And uh, what you see is where we have the Mid-Atlantic Ocean Ridge, there's parallel, parallel ridges representing different rates of expansion at different times, and you they're all uh, can be dated. And uh, it, it's uh, very interesting to see that. And uh, uh, hmm. so yes, that's maybe quite just interesting to you, but uh, uh, something we need to do. In the United States, I paid for the uh, ability to show that data. Uh, normally, the uh, it was not available, but the people that did it published it in Paris, Paris Match, uh, uh, I guess a, a publication in, in Paris, and uh, uh, 
but it, and it came out just briefly of National Geographic before the government forced them to take it off the market. And so, if you buy right. the right age of Atlas or Globe from from uh, uh, them, you can you can get that documented. But they're not allowed to do it anymore. So there's well, a yeah. This is what I've been. This is what I found when I look online. Is that um, you get a lot of strange radioactive results that say uh, the rocks are only several thousand years old or something. Um, I think it actually happens with dinosaurs as well. Yeah. You know, they're only a few thousand years old. I mean, it's crazy. But um, I think the explanation that that that, um, that sort of comes straight from my theory. It's something I haven't really talked about this time, but I'd like to talk about in. Uh, in, a, in another conference is that um, there's always water washing around within the crust and it's just it is a very dominant force in shifting minerals from A to B um, uh, to C and um, you can't really say that any rock is oh um, 50 billion years old it kind of loses its meaning because yes it might have been a, a, a solid formation that you can look at for 50 million years there might have been a rock there for 50 million years, but all that time, there's water flooding through there, very mineralized hot water. It's just flowing through the rock, and it's drastically changing the mineral composition of the rock, and it's a continual thing. Um, so, yes, if you're going to try and radio isotope a rock that has been exposed to this uh, constant washing of uh, water through it, you're going to get results that are quite recent, and in fact, I'd say it throws, completely throws off any radioactive uh, results because the base assumption of radioactive um, uh, half-life, you know, trying to get an age, aging a rock, is that the rock has stayed more or less the same in its mineral composition, apart from its radioactive decay. It's going to stay the same for the last few million years. I'm saying no. There's water rushing through that rock, and it's just going to change the rock, and it's going to change... Um, uh, you know, too many minerals, you're just not going to be able to get a good result. Uh, that would explain why everything seems to be a bit younger than it should be. I mean, yes, you can you can find rocks that are very old uh, if you look quite hard, but there's so many funny results out there. I think the big one of the big causes is that water's rushing through those rocks and just messing it up. The, right, four minutes. The, with the radio halo method, you have a way of making distinctions between these sources because the radio halo from what we call a secondary site, the radio halo, the heavy metals uh, that are involved in that, they uh, make what are called whisker crystals when they're made at a secondary site through water or whatever. And uh, that... Uh, secondary site causes the radio halo pattern to be uh, parabolical, uh, not spherical. And so only the original primordial minerals produce radio halo patterns that are, that are uh, spherical. And that's because it was a very drastic process that broke up all the, the radio, the, the whisker crystals, so they were just uh, small. But we don't have those drastic processes doing that today. You don't know of anything on the earth that would do that today, but mm. uh, so so we do have a way of getting around that. We can uh, eliminate the possibility of secondary sources, and we've been able to verify that in many ways. For instance, in coalified wood in the uranium mines, they have uh, the decay of uranium and all and other products, and we can see because they're secondary. They they're not they don't produce spherical radio halo patterns they produce uh, this elliptical type and uh, that's a, a very uh, uh, strong case that can be made in that in those conditions so we we think that uh, you need to take that into account. David, do you want to say something now? You're muted, David. David, you're muted. I can't hear you. Well, some people may like me that way. <laughs> but no, I want to thank you very much. I know we are coming to the end. We try to, you know, I always jump in and I have no scruples about stopping things because of, of time. But I want to really thank you, you know, coming out here and uh, putting
putting your neck on the line and and uh, talking about what you think. Uh, I think what we're going to do is afterwards, after this conference, sort of uh, I can get together with James and talk about what this can be. Um, after he did some presenting today, um, I think uh, having people in this area, I think it's it's very good. Uh, one of the things I do do know uh, for it to survive, we need to obviously be um, understanding that we're going to have disagreements, sometimes pretty fundamental on things. But if uh, that's okay, then you know you go forward. That's what we in the CMPS have to do, because we have you know four or five models for the for the universe. But um, I want to really thank you because uh, I certainly uh, have not heard of that kind of idea of of that you ex explained today of actually pushing up from the bottom. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it, I think uh, always, no matter how a person is thinking, you know, having someone come up and break that thinking in some sense, you usually get something out of that. Uh, whether you you agree or not, it certainly is better than just coming on and saying the same old, same old. So. That was, I think, very interesting to me. Somebody who's been in this for, you know, probably t well, ten years now, and not obviously being an expert, I just read the stuff from other people. I do, I'm aware of uh, of, of uh, Bill Lucas's work as well, and I, I think what we we can do is uh, talk about, <clears throat> you know, maybe having in the beginning here presentations because, uh, like, Bill Lucas has a lot to say about what he thinks is going on with this area. We have other people. Who have, um, I guess, more, if you can say that, more conventional views of expansion tectonics. You know, I've got the most radical views about. I think I know, that I know of really. Well, I'm not sure, but uh, okay. you, you, you know, when you've been around this, I've been around this group since 1996, so you do hear a lot of different ideas. But again, I think the important part is, I think there's an interest to this. Uh, um, please, what you can do is send feedback to myself. Um, you know, just send it to David at naturalphilosophy.org. Um, and I think what we can do uh, in the next, uh, talk about it in the next time, maybe have a presenter talk for about an hour and then uh, have a discussion about things. But um, maybe uh, if it, people do have uh, suggestions, how frequent this should be, uh, what it should be. I think having somebody present uh, works pretty well. And, um, you know, also, like I said, I think it's real important that everybody supports everybody. I think it's easy to come in and pre preach whatever you believe is right and then just sort of, uh, I'm just waiting my turn to present. Uh, I think it's interesting. I think I even heard in, like I said, Bill Lucas has a, a lot of very well thought out and very well studied uh, uh, work on this. But yet, you know, you can hear him answering questions, asking questions. And I think that's the same way with me. I, I don't sit there. Uh, my worst case is every time I think some new idea comes along, I think it's somewhat crazy that I end up start thinking, well, maybe that isn't so crazy. So uh, I think if as long as the group of people who like this area can live in that kind of world where we know we're going to have disagreements and also try to, instead of, you know, just come and talk about your stuff or cut somebody down, or, or whatever, but to try to understand each point of view, I think that's really, really, really important. Because in the end, like anything else, uh, the better ideas will end up percolating to the top, and that, I've seen that happen in the uh, uh, CNPS. So I want to thank you, James, so much for this, and I want to thank everybody who stuck around till this. I know some people are, are had to go already, but um, this is recorded in... Um, I believe today it used to give us recording links right away because you could see it, but I think they can, uh, we do need to download them and put them up to the YouTube. Usually I try to do that within a day's worth uh, of time, but um, it may be just a, a closing uh, remarks from you, James, before we wrap this up. Uh, just to say thank you and uh, thanks for the opportunity and um, yeah, I kind of enjoyed it. Um, it's the first time I've done a presentation in eight years, so I didn't know how it go, but it it, uh, it it didn't go badly, did it? I don't think it went badly. <laughs> it oh no, no. I think I think part of the part of the thing is a, is a couple. A, there's a couple of things I do want to uh, mention. Number one is if you are going to present more, you know, as I got my earphones on, I've got a microphone. You don't have to go out and buy a microphone. I got my YouTube, but but 
the thing is, is when you do have a headset, you can keep your stuff on. You won't have that problem of coming back and the, the feedback. So that's something you want. Oh, there was a lot of feedback. I could hear it. I didn't know. Not, no, no, you're okay. You're okay. The problem is, is then when you talk to someone else. So when you get a conversation going, then that's when the problems start. Because when then my voice will come out. If I really talk loud, it'll come out. People will be able to hear that through your system and back into the system. So yes. uh, anybody else who wants to participate, I know, uh, Gene, uh, you had some really excellent uh, things you were saying today. Everybody think about, you know, getting some type of thing. You can get these pretty cheap usually. You can even just have them plug in. This is a wireless one, but you can have them plug in pretty pretty easy. And all you, it, once you have this, you can pretty much uh, feel safe about it. And um, also, I, I, I would uh, uh, I'd love to see, James, as my own opinion would be for you to demonstrate some of the software you've done. So... Uh, and that would be, I, I think, an excellent presentation. So thank you very much. Thank everybody here. It's now 2.05. We've gone over a little bit. And uh, we will keep everybody informed. Go to our website. Um, we do have a newsletter that's going to be coming out very shortly. Really some exciting news. Uh, we do have our conference coming up. But I've been, I just came up with something a couple of days ago, and I've been working earnestly on it. And I've talked to a few people about it, and they are just blown, uh, blown. Uh, their minds are blown. Uh, I think everybody here um, can will be involved with it. So a lot of exciting things. Make sure you you keep up to date. Also, I just want to encourage everybody to make sure you have a Gmail account, a Google account. Why? Because then you can subscribe to all these channels. Uh, people who have uh, work here, having a YouTube channel today and age is something that really is really worth thinking about. And all of you, the more we all support each other, the better it's going to be. So. Um, it's really important for everybody here to have their Gmail account. And if you don't get one, go to our web homepage, naturalphilosophy.org, and subscribe to people. You don't even have to follow them too much, but those things do help. It's, uh, how do you say, supporting each other's work, because I'm really big fans of a lot of people's work. And I'm a fan of uh, Jim's work, James' work, also Bill's work. Um, you know, I know Bill Howells here. I know, I know uh, his work, Jim Marison, all, all these people. I appreciate everybody's uh, participation. So thank you very much, and we will stop this recording. Okay.